Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning on Friday, the 20th of October. I had to check my calendar then. Um, I can't believe that it is already coming up to Halloween, which I'm sure we agree is a great time of year. Um, if you're not someone who celebrates Halloween, I'm sure you can still enjoy this time of year when it's cozy and we get to really enjoy kind of hunkering down in the evening with a warm drink and something to read or watch. So I have to say autumn is my favourite season. We'll be asking our guest shortly uh, what his favourite season is. I'm very excited to announce that we have Mark Taylor coming on our show today. Um, if you haven't heard of Mark, you might have seen our flyer about him this week. Um, but Mark is going to be coming to talk to us about child-centred education. Um, I'll let Mark tell us a bit more about himself when he joins. But he is um, a podcaster, he is a passionate educator, and he is very passionate about music, the arts, creativity. Um, and we'll be finding out about that from Mark today um, through the next hour together. So, fingers crossed. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. How are you? Oh, wow. Wow, this is some Halloween magic because I can hear you. I can see you. <laughs> oh, it's always a relief for me on Teachers Talk Radio where the tech goes in our favour. So good morning. I'm glad. How are you doing, Mark? Um, I'm very well. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Great. Me too, me too. We're so happy that you're here to talk to us on Teachers Talk Radio today. Um, so just as you entered the studio, Mark, I was talking about how autumn, I think, is hands down the best season. But what's your opinion? Um, oh, well, I think one of the greatest things about being in the UK is that the seasons all kind of feel like they have their own kind of magic. But there is something about the autumn, I think, just that kind of the, the the leaves changing, that sort of sense of sort of winding down and kind of bringing everything small, as it were, a little bit of chance to sort of reflect um, before we sort of head into the winter and then start to get in the spring. I know, gosh, and it feels like these seasons just fly by as well, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. We were just oh. saying, having hit sort of half term, it's that kind of, surely we only just started back at school. I know. I just, and I was just, as I introduced the show, I was thinking, how is it the 20th of October today? Yes. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so so tell us then, Mark, before, um, and I have to say, I'm so excited to talk to you about child-centered education. I've got a long list of questions for you today. <laughs> um, but before we go then, let, let's hear more about you. Maybe could you tell us about what is your current role? And maybe if you're happy to, tell us about your career education through the years as well. Yeah, so I have a sort of a, a slightly one step removed version of education. So I'm actually a musician by trade. I went to music college in London and I've been playing percussion and drums um, since sort of the mid 90s. Wow. Um, so that's kind of been my my passion. It's, it's been the thing that kind of gave me my voice when I was a teenager. And luckily I had the opportunity to sort of dive into that. And then from sort of being a, a performer, which I, which I still do, I was able to then sort of share those skills in schools by doing sort of whole class workshops. I do some individual drum and percussion teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and that took me into sort of seeing the education from the inside out, as it were. <laughs> and, um, and so that's kind of how I sort of got passionate about it. At the same time, my kids were kind of going through school. And mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that I kind of realised was there was quite a lot of headlines about what you were hearing the education was about, what the school was about, what was important for the children. But I also kind of had this sense of that wasn't what I was hearing from being a dad at home in terms mm -hmm. of what they were sort of getting out of school and what they were feeling about being in school and all of that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of got me really interested in, in terms of what's possible within education, how that works, how I, when I go in and teach drums and percussion and my sort of little role within a school um, kind of can be different from a mindset point of view, but also in terms of sort of fulfilling that kind of my beliefs, you know, the mm -hmm. amazing thing about being a, a musician is the fact that you fail all the time. You know, you don't just suddenly pick up a drumstick in my case and play a rhythm. You know, there's a whole learning curve as there is with everything that you're learning, but mm -hmm. you kind of really feel that sort of failure, but then that gradual 
getting better and better the more you do in having systems and, and theories in place to help you with that. And so, yeah, I sort of found that really fascinating. And that took me into my kind of world of, of you know, sharing these stories online and kind of being in a position to sort of help others and in, in that kind of parental and musical standpoint to begin with, rather than that sort of traditional classroom teacher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And so when did you first get into to kind of drums and percussion? Were you, do you remember how old you were? Yeah, exactly. I remember because I'd um, at primary school, um, we'd had to do, I didn't have to do, but um, we did recorders in choir and it was a very musical school that the head teacher was really king that we listened to music. So our assemblies were filled with classical music and exposure wow. to, um, and that was amazing. And then as you kind of do when you sort of hit that sort of 11 going into secondary school, I was obviously going to be a professional football player because every boy wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, and I kind of thought, yeah, music's been great, but it's not necessarily something I want to do um, going forward. Okay. Um, but our secondary school, um, the first year, so um, year one as it was then, year seven as it obviously is now, um, the first year you had to learn an instrument and it was paid for by the school and I think it was kind of based on the American sort of band system so essentially okay. our, our music lessons were a wind band and so every pupil had music lessons and in any, any given instrument and so when we were just finishing at primary school the head of music came round, got us to clap a few rhythms blow into a mouthpiece sing a few things and they kind of got an idea of where they thought your talents might lie wow um, I and, love that and and, and and that was my kind my kind of way in and I so I thought, well, drums sounds like the, the best of a bad bunch, <laughs> as it were. And mm -hmm. um, and he said, oh, no, you seem, you know, rhythm seems to be maybe your thing. So why don't you learn the drums? And, and so I sort of went to secondary school and started having lessons and then thought, oh, there's something about this that I really like. I, I had that. a fantastic drum teacher who said, you know, you seem to be really keen. You're really enjoying it. Would you like some private lessons, which in hindsight, you know, he did for peanuts <laughs> and, and was able to sort of really support me going through. Um, and so, yeah, so it really started because I just had that exposure at that young age and, and then had the opportunity to kind of have the lessons and then play in, you know, junior wind band, senior wind band. And then that went all the way through to county level and then national level and then obviously into music college and into the profession. Wow. I, lo I love how you make that sound so effortless. <laughs> Just, well, you know, this amazing musical journey. <laughs> well, I, 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 it's, it's, it's amazing that you say that because I think that's really important. It, it, at the time, it did and it didn't. You know, there's the, the 10,000 hour rule is very true. <laughs> there's lots of hours that go into the practice. Mm -hmm. But I think the really key thing at that time for me was that there was always someone just ahead of me that was showing me the path that was possible. So there was the person who was already in the senior wind band when I was in the junior wind band and the person who was then doing their A-levels and then doing all sorts of amazing concerts. And then I knew that they were going to music college and moving away and mm -hmm. then they were doing something in an orchestra. So even though you still have to obviously put the work in and it has to be something you're really into, mm -hmm. I could see all of those steps and I had a com I was able to have a conversation with someone or be given that opportunity to follow that if it was my path, which in, in the end it, it sort of was. But I think without seeing all of that in that sort of almost like following the yellow brick road kind of thing, I'm not sure mm -hmm. I would have done that because I came from a, a, a relatively small mining town. My parents weren't musicians. It wasn't something I was exposed mm -hmm. to at a very young age. It was just the fact that school gave me that opportunity. And we were lucky yeah. enough that we had heads of music and, and the head of the school who was very keen and supportive of what music was going to be able to offer people. Wow, I love that, Mark. And um, something to pick up on, you said there, your, your parents weren't musicians. So how did they take to suddenly a child that wanted to play drums, <laughs> wanted to play drums of all the instruments? Did you wow. have a drum set at home or was that something you did like at your drum teacher's house? <laughs> no, we, we had them at home and it was, they were, they were incredibly supportive. Um, I think the very beginning, they were kind of okay so how does this work and, and you know initially you get a, a small pad and a pair of drumsticks that you can just play with at home and then I said I think I really need a drum kit and you know we weren't in a position to go and buy a brand new drum kit or anything like that and so mm -hmm. we found a second-hand drum kit I think it might have even been as much as 50 pounds in the paper and kind of and that was it and I was able to start practicing at home um, and then and then I said, actually, I think I need one. Well, it turned out I did need one with more drums and you know and more things once I kind of knew more about what it was all about. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, OK, well, if you want it, then you can sort of will support you to do it. And so they got me the drum kit and I repaid it with my my then thriving car washing business that I did for my dad and my <laughs> neighbours and, and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> 
Um, Brilliant. But, but that sort of ingenuity sort of came out of that of that need, kind of. I really wanted it. I found out what I wanted, and we sort of came up with a plan. And luckily, they were very supportive about me practicing. But I think I think probably the most important thing, and this is where a lot of the things that we talked about today will probably tie in, was the fact that I wasn't just doing it for the sake of it, and they never knew what was going on. I was doing, I was practicing for the next rehearsal for something they were supporting yeah. me with, and then there'd be a concert this weekend or that weekend, so they could see the reason for doing it. A bit like you know, going to football practice. You know, there's a game. Yeah, on Saturday, yeah. So everything you're doing feeds into that passion and that ability to to do it for a reason I absolutely love that what a cool journey and and personally I'm very interested because um because I've got three children Mark and my middle one my, my son um is playing drums at the moment he started a couple of years ago and uh, I think music teachers are a very special breed because you know he my music the music teacher only sees my son once a week and you've really got to try and you know get to know them, get to learn how to engage them in such a short period of time, you know, yeah. to, to make a connection. I think it takes a very special person, but also someone who's obviously got that passion for the instrument. Um, but yeah, so I was a French horn player, actually. I'm a, I'm a brass player and I played um, the trumpet, the cornet and the French horn. And I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, I remember, you know, you'd join a, an orchestra or a brass band as like third horn and then you'd go up to second horn. And then when you were first horn, like that felt really amazing like mentoring those new people coming in and so yeah I'm kind of excited for him he's only at the start of his journey he's only he's just turned nine um but yeah he comes home and he, I'll go what did you do in drumming today and he uh he was telling me this week about paradiddles which yeah. I've never I mean we don't have that in the in the brass world <laughs> <laughs> no that, well paradiddles are rudiment it's kind of like the drumming equivalent of scales it's kind of giving you coordination okay, and techniques okay. it supports you with with things along those ways yeah but yeah get, get him to show you what the sticking is that's quite an interesting one the sticking <laughs> yeah so a, a paradiddle is based on a type of sticking um so it's you've lo so you've lost me already <laughs> i'll write this down <laughs> i'll ask him tonight, but that's, ask that's, him tonight. i'll ask him and I, you know i was even saying to my students at uni this week like when we look at mri brain scans we see that the two things that help you build those neural pathways unlike anything else are learning a foreign language and, and playing an instrument so there really is something there isn't there as well not just for our well-being but like for our actual like physical brain development in playing an instrument there, there absolutely is and I, one of the things that I say quite a lot when when a child gets frustrated about the the ability to not just be able to do it because I think one of the things that I often pick up is that children don't necessarily want to ask questions they don't necessarily want to tell you that they don't know anything but when you're in a one-to-one -one music lesson then that's exactly where you are <laughs> you know yeah. you don't know how it goes and we're going to explore this together and we're going to grow and, and, and see how that goes um, and, and one of the things I say is the fact that, that let's think about what you're trying to do and why it feels difficult and I, and I also relate it to me I said I do exactly the same process you know you're trying to connect what your brain is seeing how it's going into your mind how it's connecting all the neuro pathways to your both hands, both legs, your ear, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And each, each time you do it, it gets clearer and it gets better and it kind of builds up those foundations. And so each time you do it, it gets more entrenched. And therefore, that's why you couldn't do it, you know, a minute ago, but in five minutes, you'll do it without thinking about it. And so I say I do exactly the same thing. Now, if I've got something difficult to play, I do it slowly. I do the repetition. I keep all those things going. And, and it's the same thing. So once they kind of realize that it's a it's a process and I, and I like you just said, I said, you know, that the. the the images that you can see when people have been wired up to, to machines and they're showing the whole brain just literally coming alive when you're doing all these things together. I said, that's the reason it feels so good, but it's also why it can feel so difficult to begin mm -hmm. with. But as long as you sort of embrace the journey and what you're trying to do and the fact that you can get some quick wins quite quickly um, makes a really big difference because, of course, the better you are, the, the easier it is to do harder things quicker, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah. and, and so they start to feel the benefit of that as they go through. And then they kind of they ease into what that feels like as a learning process. And then they can go and put that into the rest of their learning as well. Because one of the things I sort of mentioned is that kind of, you know, can you do the two times table? And they laugh at me. And I said, but when you first started doing the two times table, could you do it? And they were like, no. And I said, and now mm -hmm. you're doing whatever you're <laughs> able to do in maths or English or science or whatever it is. Yeah. That you're but they suddenly start to remember the process of all those things. And I think they can then start to um, embrace that learning concept, as it were, in a much more sort of organic way across any subject or any particular area. 
Love that. Absolutely love that, Mark. Amazing. Oh, I feel like we could just talk about musical day and I've just realised that's not even the topic <laughs> that we've invited you to talk about. So, you know, let, maybe we'll need you back for part two where we'll just talk about music. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know it will tie in through today because um, the reason we invited you on, I was hoping we could have a chat today about child-centred education. Um, so I was hoping, and welcome to everyone listening in, welcome, I can see we've got lots and lots of people listening um, here on Podbean and live on um, the website. First of all, Mark, can you maybe tell me how you would define child-centred education? I think I would define it as an education which is purely about creating it for you or one, as <laughs> is, is it were. Um, and, and, I, and I think the, the way I often think about it in practical terms is that if you're, if you're really struggling, um, then you suddenly get your own centered version of education you get you know maybe one-on-one -on -one tuition um you have you get given the opportunity to kind of delve into what it is that you need to support your needs mm -hmm. in order to thrive and it, that might be the same um is a is a high achiever um you might suddenly be, get exposed to other opportunities that can kind of stretch you in some way um mm -hmm. and i think the reality is is that the majority of people somewhere in the middle of that don't understand what a child-centered education would be because they just do what they have to do you know you go to school because you do and you you do all of those things and so I think for me a child-centered idea of education is actually creating the education that you want or a school can create for any given pupil based on their skill set their abilities their passion um, and all of those things together which of course is difficult in this sort of mass education world. But I think once you start with that sense of what does this child particularly need to give to make them thrive, then that becomes a child centered version of education. Amazing. And do you know, it's really interesting. Like we often think, of course, how would education not be child centered? But I mean, you only have to look at some of the, you know, the pressure of SATs testing and the accountability on, on all these things that really don't seem so child centered. Um, to realise how important it is that we kind of talk about it today. And um, I'm sure you know the report, but I was sharing with my students how we obviously had the Plowden report um, back in 1967. little history lesson here for our listeners. Uh, Maria Plowden, I see a woman uh, as well in educational history. Um, and with the Plowden report, talking about the need for that child-centred pedagogy. But it just, it just felt like that just fell on deaf ears. And I, and I still feel like even what we're saying today, Mark, is probably falling on deaf ears in terms of educational policy because how how child-centered can our education be if I look at like year six if I step into a year six classroom how child-centered is it where where is the voice coming from and like what are the voices about and it still just seems so teacher-led in many situations what do you think um I think it's exactly what it's like and the the reality is is that you can look at it two ways I think the majority of people's experiences are probably that the schools are under an awful lot of pressure from Ofsted and all the accountability and having to cover things in a certain way and, and do it with, within the guidelines so that you can you know, get whatever grade you need to get to look good, which enables you to get more pupils and thrive and all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, but they're, they're, that's happening because they're having to do it in a certain way. There are some schools and some educational leaders who I just find amazing who realise that if you have a child-centred idea of education with a really broad, rich experience and educational journey, you'll get all that already. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is, is that the accountability is so short-lived. And so, like you said about policy, you know, of course, we could create a fantastic education policy for the next 50 years, except government cycles are five years and so that's never going to yeah, happen yeah. you know Ofsted cycles or however many years between each one you know you have to be able to do this this and this it has to be ticked it has to be in a position where you're achieving what's been uh, supposed to be achieved um, and so I think you either end up in this world of having to go down we're going to do what we have to do because that's what we need to do or you you're brave enough and you have the experience enough to go I'm going to create a school in a learning environment which is rich and full of what we know is important as educators. And yes, of course, you have to create the environment and do what you need to do from a policy standpoint and all of that. But you can do that and have faith that what you're teaching and the, what you're creating within your school environment is going to give you those things further down the line. But I think to be able to communicate that as a head to governors or governors to a head or to have that longevity of this is what we're trying to achieve and why. Mm -hmm. um, is a really difficult thing to do and and I can understand why that like I said often falls on deaf ears or, or is really hard to achieve. 
Mm-hmm. No, definitely. That's really thoughtful. Thank you, Mark. So I wonder then, like, it's, it sounds a, a great idea, but what might this actually look like in the community, like in terms of in our school or, you know, with clubs, with family, in our local community? Like, how, how would this manifest itself? So I think for me, it's... The, the, I, when, I, when I often talk about community at large, if you kind of think that everyone is a stakeholder of any given young person, so you might be the parent, you might be a teacher, you might be doing the football club, the music club, whatever it happens to be, we all have an influence on this person. Um, so depending on where you're starting from, if we start with the idea of, okay, so it's going to be child-centred, so you know, what's the passion, what is it that this child likes to do, how can we support them in that? And it might be, and we hope that you have a fantastic school that gives you all these opportunities. It might be your school's not that in that position. And so therefore you're literally going to school and doing what you have to do, but it's not a great experience for you. But it might be that your family life and your local community has a rich um, selection of clubs, whether it's sport, whether it's music, whether it's arts, creativity, whatever it happens to be. And Mm -hmm. so each person's able to then say, okay, so we can see that you get lit up by music or sport or science. Did you know this person here has this organization or this particular club at school can do this? And whatever it happens to be, you're able to sort of support that child to go, why don't we just explore that and see what that is? And and as the adults and the people in creating the environment, we kind of know how to do that and put the sort of the, the support barriers in place to make it safe and all of that kind of thing. But you can give them the experience of kind of, yeah, there's a learning opportunity here for you, which we think you would be able to explore and see. And it, of course, it's any individual's choice how far they go with that. Mm-hmm. But what it means is that every part of the community and every person who's involved with a child has that ability to kind of make that real difference and open up the sense that, you know, it's your life and the opportunities are there for you to take rather than just, we're just learning for the sake of learning because that's what you do from four to 18. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, definitely. And and I wonder, Mark, thinking of um, maybe of, of your own um, child or children that you, that you mentioned, um, how do you think, what were the, their kind of key ways that they found, you know, this passion as they were growing up, do you think? Was it through things like extracurricular clubs or do you think it was supported through the school? I think it was a combination of both, actually. So if, if I think about um, the transition from secondary school to prime, uh, from primary school to secondary school, um, our middle child chose a school further away um, mm-hmm. because he was really into computers and really into music. And he walked into the computer room and just the, the person who's teaching computers just absolutely bewildered him and said, oh, this is fantastic. Um, wow. and like, I want to spend time doing that. And we already knew that it had a fantastic music department and he was already learning the guitar at that point. Wow. He's like, I can go to the school, which is li- literally at the end of our road, which has no music and had very limited IT support, or we can take you five miles away and you have the opportunity of all of that. So that's the starting point, because then what happened is, is that, you know, his his social group within school became the music department, became all of that sort of IT related stuff, which kind of worked its way to eventually in sort of enjoying engineering and that kind of thing. Um, but that was then also supported by the fact that he liked those things. So he then also did football out of school. You know, he went to the local music service um, and had the chance to play in lots of different bands and have lots of experiences that way. So we were lucky that we were in a position that to get him into a school that he really liked and then also have that support outside as well mm-hmm. um and 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 so uh, i think it's a combination of both and it's just a question of seeing which is which whereas our younger daughter went to the same school because she got into the same school on a, on the sibling link which she wouldn't have done <laughs> that not been the case mm-hmm. sort of a few years difference with them but she was really into gymnastics really into sport and the school's very good at sport, but actually the majority of that kind of gymnastics focus was actually a club outside, which then developed to another club and another club and another club, all the way to doing all manner of tumbling stuff, which like the things you see on the telly, which I've no idea how wow. she even does. Wow, amazing. Having, having not quite perfected the forward roll myself yet. <laughs> <laughs> Something about tuck your head in, that's all I remember. I, my I, think, I think that's it. So I think it can be different for every child, and I think it can be different yeah. even within even within the same family um and so yes yeah, so i think it's it is just that kind of I, I i think it always just comes down to the next conversation and the next opportunity and just being 
free enough to kind of say, okay, well, where are we today? You know, where are those opportunities? What can we do? And, um, and where can we sort of put our energy? Yeah, I love that. And, and so fascinating hearing, you know, it always fascinates me, children in the same family with such different interests, you know, the nature versus nurture, the old debate, we always come back to it Absolutely. at university. And, you know, it's so interesting seeing how your children have those different interests. And, but also equally, just really showing how important it is that we're offering those wide range of subjects. You know, they weren't going there going, oh, I really like this maths classroom. Again, nothing, nothing against maths. <laughs> you know, they weren't saying, look at the English and maths provision, which we know dominate um, particularly in primary, but they, it was about all these other things and these other opportunities to really connect with their passions, wasn't it? Yeah, it absolutely was. And, um, and, and it's interesting you mentioned the English and maths because I think, I think you also have to make these things relevant to um, the people that you're teaching. So for example, you know, I did English and maths at school. It wasn't my most favorite thing in the world, but as soon as I got out into my, into my professional world, you know, suddenly I was having to to write emails and and put proposals together to set an orchestra up or or to to bid for um, a particular festival that was going on. So I needed really detailed budgets. I needed to sort of show financially how it was all put together, as well as be able to present it and put it put it together on paper as well. And at mm -hmm. that point, one, I was really grateful for the the fact that I'd learned English and maths in the way that I had. But also it, it became important that I knew all the all the intricacies of it, which I maybe didn't care about when I was younger, but actually it suddenly became important and therefore it was relevant. And I think that's one of the things about the idea of project based learning, which I know when schools do that, it becomes so, so exciting for children because they're actually doing something which is relevant in the here and now. And then you can you're, you're more than willing to learn and to find out all the skills that you need to do that because it's got a purpose rather than just it happens to be, you know, Wednesday afternoon at period four. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, of course, not to discredit English and maths and you're totally right, you know, they are the core of, of what we need for many roles in society. But yeah, just great, great to hear about where schools are really understanding how the arts, for example, also need that valid place. Yeah, and and and, and I think the sad thing from, from my experience is just how that is, you know, less and less and less of, of an opportunity. And um, one of the things I experienced was um, coming back to a school after a summer holiday to say, um, brilliant, lovely to see you. You can't teach between nine and whenever the first break was because that's English and maths now so you can't do that um, and I know the room that you had was was okay except now we need you to teach under this staircase in the hallway oh my goodness and, well because of maths boosters going on I bet oh, well yeah they used the room yeah they used the room for something else and and I and, and I, and I can under it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they deemed the room being used in a different way as more important but mm -hmm. then that means the music side of everything which is what then becomes yeah. the environment of the school and so you know it, it suddenly was that kind of you know you're trying to, you're asking me basically to teach four children for 10 minutes under a staircase the the, the teachers weren't able to support the children to come to their lessons so I had to go and get them and take them back which means eventually you had about seven minutes to wow. teach them. what and and, what? and 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 that's that's not an unusual situation for a lot of schools if they've got any music going on at all wow I mean yeah actually now you raise that point my son's um drum lesson we pay for the council um to do lessons within the school day and I think it's 15 minutes yeah. And I mean, like you say, when you know you've got to spend hours and hours to actually start to develop any, you know, real skill, it just, yeah, it's bamboozling, isn't it? But at least I'm, I'm just glad that he's able to support it within the school day because you know it's so hard, isn't it, in the evenings trying to, to ferry them everywhere. But yeah, 10, ten minute lesson and when you had to go get them yourself, my goodness. Yeah, but I've just... done what, one bang, one bang on the drum and then... <laughs> exactly, and hope it was in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that brings up another interesting point because um, one of the things I do mention to my pupils along those lines is the fact I sort of I say to them you know how many maths and English lessons do you have in a week and they say well we have one every day or whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. within their timetable and so I was I'm able then to say and we have like you know maybe half an hour a week or twenty minutes a week or whatever it happens to be in the school and I said so if you imagined you only learn English or maths for twenty minutes a week how proficient wow. do you think you would be in that subject and how much progression would you be making and then the, the, the sort of the light bulb moment is that kind of 
<laughs> I probably wouldn't be where I am now. And, and I said, you know, music's not the same. You know, you have individual lessons, which is different than being in a classroom. But then you start to see why, you know, the practicing and the doing it outside of your lesson is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do a lot of that, a, a lot of that kind of thing. And, and I think that also sort of steers you into maybe the way education might go in the future, where teachers are more of a kind of a mentor you know let's explore mm -hmm. what we can do make sure you understand the theory and what you're trying to achieve but a lot of it you can now do on your own you know if you know where to get the resources if you know how to practice if you know how to learn mm -hmm. you know with you know the wide things that are out there these days as long as it's well organized and put in place um you know it can look very different amazing and yeah also important to know every every school is different isn't it and there Absolutely. you know Absolutely. oh my god i'm just looking at the time and i can't believe mark we're halfway through <laughs> <laughs> i'm not happy about this because i've got so much more to ask you uh, but what we're going to do let's go play the news so feel free to uh go grab a quick drink and to everyone listening we'll be back with our amazing guest mark taylor in about six minutes time see you in a minute mark bye in today's educational environment, students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face, -face, online and blended learning courses. Canvas by Instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly, and access actionable data that drives student success. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Are you looking for lesson planning materials to kickstart the new term? We've got you covered. The Day is a global online resource that turns the news into lessons. We're offering listeners a free resource on Andrew Tate that you can find on thedaynews.co forward slash Tate. Inspire personal development and critical thinking for your students by downloading the Tate Debate today and feel more confident addressing sensitive topics with your class. Visit thedaynews.co forward slash Tate to find out more. This is Teachers Talk Radio and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Just Stop Oil have spray painted universities across England. The climate campaigners used orange paint to coat buildings at the universities of Leeds, Manchester and Cambridge, according to a report on the BBC News website. The latest protests came after other universities across the country were also targeted. Just Stop Oil say the protests are against the UK government's plans to licence new oil and gas projects. The BBC report featured comments from a spokesperson for University of Leeds, which said that whilst they support the right to legal protest, they were hugely disappointed that the results had been vandalism. At the University of Cambridge, a protester painted the neo-Gothic King's College orange and was confronted by members of the public. The majority of protesters have been arrested and charged with criminal damage. After the Tory party conference, attention turned to Labour's proposals for education should they be elected. Bridget Phillipson, Shadow Education Secretary, said a Labour government would upskill non-math specialists in primary schools to create the maths equivalent to phonics. The announcement marks a clear dividing line with Conservative policies, with Labour focused on the youngest school children, whilst Conservatives have focused on extending compulsory maths teaching to 18. The curriculum review would also be tasked with bringing maths to life and directing teachers to show children how numeracy is used in the world around them. The plans have been tentatively welcomed by the NAHT and General Secretary Paul Whiteman said it was vital that Labour builds upon the excellent maths teaching that is already taking place. Jeff Barton of Askell added, Ensuring that primary schools have the funding for the resources they need was vital to improving attainment. 
After the distressing news of events unfolding in Israel, many news outlets have reported on government plans to support Jewish schools with extra security guards. Security and police patrols have already been increased, but the government has given £3 million in funding. Measures taken by some schools already include pupils being told to remove blazers and school trips being postponed. The BBC also reported that three schools have closed due to concerns. The Community Security Trust, CST, which provides protection for Jewish communities in the UK, said there had been 139 anti-Semitic incidents since the recent attacks on Israel. At this time last year, there had been only 21 incidents. A government spokesperson said it was very concerned a small number of Jewish faith schools had temporarily closed and that it would be working to support them to open safely. Finally, BBC Wales education correspondent Bethan Lewis writes that children as young as seven or eight are using social media, according to a major survey in Wales. Responses from more than 32,000 children aged 7 to 11 suggest almost half use social media sites or apps a few times a week. Public health experts said the data was concerning, as most social media carry minimum age recommendations of 13. Parents also responded with many saying they found it hard to strike the right balance between the benefits and pitfalls of smartphones. Full details of the survey can be found on the BBC Wales section of the news website. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Welcome back, welcome back. Uh, you are here on Teachers Talk Radio with me, Poppy Gibson, and my very special guest, Mark Taylor. Welcome back, Mark. Uh, thanks, Poppy. Did you take a nice break there? I did. Deep breath. Glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Oh, I managed. I'm very impressed. Better than water, although you've gone for the healthy option. I managed to run into the kitchen, heat up my milk, make a hot chocolate with hazelnut syrup, and add whipped cream on top. <laughs> I've got it nailed. I've got I'm a, that nailed. I'm a novice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we all have to start at the beginning. <laughs> but welcome back and um, welcome back to everyone listening. So we've got some brand new listeners joining us here this morning. And we're talking to Mark today, um, well, about lots of things. I feel like there's too much to talk about. But we're going to be focusing on the second half of the show on child centered education. And before the break, if you were with us, we were thinking about how important it is that children have the chance to follow their passions and interests such as music, computing, sport. Um, so we finished before the break there, Mark, talking about, um, you know, your work as a music teacher and how that actually might look like seven minutes in a lesson by the time you've <laughs> been allocated a classroom under the staircase, which um, I'm sure hopefully wasn't as quite as bad as Harry Potter's um, bedroom. <laughs> no, not quite. Um, so Honestly, then, do you, do you think child centered education is something we can achieve in our current education system? I think it's possible if we decide that we'd like it to be possible, um, because we, we know it's possible for children that need that extra support. Um, like I said at the beginning, you know, whether it's because they're struggling and need extra sort of support um, from a, a special educational needs point of view, maybe, or if you're high achieving. Um, but I think also depending on how you structure your education within in your learning environment stepping away from the the kind of the rote learning the kind of just sit there and we'll give you knowledge actually as it starts to become more project based or whether you're able to set a kind of an idea of this is what we're trying to achieve i'm setting the the foundation and the boundaries of what we're going to be studying but you're going mm -hmm. to take your own initiative and you're going to take your own study to kind of help develop how that's going to look you mm -hmm. know and and i think at that point it becomes very child centered because you're you're giving the children the creativity that they need and the structure but the supportive environment for them to sort of make decisions on their own they're not passing or failing they're exploring and then we're all learning together from a, from the staff point of view to mm -hmm. any individual child or maybe if you're obviously we're working in groups or as a class or however it's it's put together and at that point it becomes child-centered because they'll lean into what they're interested in um, and that doesn't take away from you know the foundational education that's obviously needed but it means that there's more flexibility and more kind of personalized um, focus on, on what you want to learn 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds good, doesn't it? But I've got to say, Mark, when I look at, so for example, my, my youngest um, has just gone into reception and I went in, you know, had the reception talk and I can see that to me seems child focused, you know, child centered because they're saying, you know, we ask children what they like. We, you know, they got to eat fruits yesterday based on a, you know, hand a surprise book and that, that seems very child centered. But then I feel like there's then the primary and secondary, maybe not so much. And then they come to me at university level and they're not quite ready for it to be centered on them again. Like, you know, they just, and I'll be honest, students, if any of my students are listening, you know, I think you're absolutely amazing, but they're not always ready to take the driving seat again. And, and some students I feel do want me just to tell them the answers sometimes. Again, sorry, students, <laughs> but, are, you know, are we really preparing them to be centered on them or, or actually do you think they prefer to be more passive? Um, I think you only know what you know. Um, and so if you think about it from a child's point of view, you know, you're, you're in your, envi your learning environment for you know, six, seven, eight hours a day um, from when you're four, you know, and so you only know what you're being told. And even if you've got a different viewpoint outside of the school environment, you, you know, you're being told the rest of it day in, day out. And I think you make a great point about that sort of early years. They're a guiding light to what's possible. And the question would be, is why is that so child-centred at that age? And then, like I say, not as you head further into primary and into secondary. And, and that's just the way the system's organised. You know, it, we talked about policy. You know, we could decide that all we want to do is to develop what we've created so wonderfully at that early age and bring it through. I mean, it's entirely possible. It's just that, you know, in recent, well, many recent years, it's that it's kind of right. That was really great. You know, like you say, reception, um, we start to get further and further into primary school and it's kind of a now you need to start learning. Well, mm -hmm. what did people think they were doing when they were doing <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and, and how happy they were. I mean, I, I always yeah. think... For, for me, the, the, the epitome is if I see a child, especially in primary, if they're skipping down a corridor or across the playground, you know they are just loving life at that moment. Oh, and, love that. and if you can kind of think, if I can keep that feeling for them as long as possible, then then you're doing something right. Um, and and I think that's kind of the that's kind of the key thing. And there are some schools that are able to do that, like say, and bring that sort of early years philosophy through. But because of the, the way the, the school system currently is, you know, you know, we're doing phonics, we're doing maths, you have to have this amount of time doing this. And it's all so very structured in that way. You know, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that you're ready for SAT. So we're going to do boosters. It's like, well, not surprisingly, that's going to get beaten out of you as a child. And it's kind of, I think now we're in this position of, you know, well-being is really important, but we're almost sort of injuring our children in some way and then giving them a plaster to say, but it's okay because we'll support you with mindfulness or whatever it happens to be. And those things are incredibly important. But if we had that different type of system in place before, then everyone would just be thriving. Yes, you need to be, I think the, the conversations around mental health and well-being are incredibly important and it's a really welcome change and development. But I think mm -hmm. we're also causing the same problem as we go through. And I think the thing that kind of really strikes me is that I think back to sort of when my kids were toddlers and at no point do I think I ever said, right, now it's time you're going to learn to walk. Now it's time <laughs> you're going to learn to talk. Now it's time you're going to do this. It's just very organic, isn't it? You create a safe yeah. environment. They're ready to start to move. They want to get stronger. They want to kind of stand up. They want to take their first steps. And I think that we're programmed to do that in everything that we're learning. Our job as educators is to create an environment that would allow that to happen all the way through to 18 and beyond. Um, and I think what we're actually doing as, a, as an education system is we're just stopping that from happening. And like I said, it becomes very apparent because we have this real divide between early years where it's very much kind of play orientated and child focused and the chance to really choose what's going on to that kind of, but now you're older and you're going to be learning and here's how we're going to do it. And it's not surprising that we suddenly have that disconnect. A hundred percent. And Mark, I totally agree with you. I, I mentioned my daughter's in reception. I actually had her parents evening and my, my son who drums, <laughs> the one who does the drums, his parents evening. So he's year four. So I had them on the same day. I had her reception parents evening and his year four parents evening. So I went to, to his and there was obviously like, you know, the pile of his maths, but well, two maths books. English book, science book, like there's the big pile waiting for me in the corridor. I'm sure yeah. you remember Mark from Parents mm -hmm. Evening. And, and I sat down on the chair and I looked through all his books with him and picked out some bits to chat to him about. And then I then I had my um, daughter's one and I, you know, all the teachers are in the hall all around the outside with their desks. So lots of books in the middle. And I was looking around for books for ages and I couldn't find her books. 
And then I thought, actually, maybe, because year one and year two were in the hall as well as reception, I thought, maybe she doesn't have books. And when it was my appointment, I went over and I said, I couldn't find her books. Do they not have books in reception? She's like, no, no, we don't have any books. And I was like, that's really cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> but but I was, I was so, you know, institutionalized <laughs> looking for piles of books that, you know, wow yeah there weren't there were no books so like you say what are they doing it's not like they're not learning absolutely they don't need a book with a underlined title with a ruler do you know what I mean yeah yeah absolutely yeah and I, interesting and, and and the parents evening thing is really interesting because um you, from that sort of personalized learning and child-centered education standpoint you know we have one child whose birthday is in September and <laughs> we have two children whose birthdays are in July and August and wow Every like year, opposite ends yeah and every <laughs> year we had the same conversation with different teachers um and they were saying oh yes um you know the oldest one you know seems to be grasping it all really well and going on really well the younger ones they're doing really well and it seems to be that in this last few weeks that everything's coming together and you'd have that conversation of like but some of the children in this class are like 20 or 25 percent older than yeah. the other children so that's not child-centered or personalized in any way because you'll try your your sort of because you know year one or year two has to look like this and this is where we think they should be but this child's almost an entire year younger so if, yeah. if there was a child well why aren't you walking at six months because this child at you know 16 months is walking. <laughs> yeah. it, beca it becomes yeah, a nonsense wow. and you wonder why people you know you don't follow that on why is that different suddenly at four and five or you know 10 and 11 and yeah. I, know, I know that changes a little bit as they get older and, and that kind of thing but certainly in that primary age it, it makes perfect sense that that would be the case and and I know there were lots of parents who got really worried about those things. And we used to quite honestly laugh and just say, look, this is our experience. Do you not think that's the case? And they go, well, we can kind of understand that. <laughs> and we're just like, well, I mean, that's just understanding children generally, you know, yeah. just, just as a parent, you know, it makes it makes perfect sense that um, a child that was born in September might be in a different developmental stage than one which was born nearly a year later. Yeah, yeah, they've had an extra nine, 10, 11 months on the planet <laughs> yeah. looking at books or being spoken to. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, so I want to pick on something you said there, Mark. You mentioned, you know, about kind of the impact on, on well-being. How do you think all of this would support um, well-being for our children? Well, I think, I think one of the things is time. I think part of the problem in terms of detrimental feelings of well-being is the fact that there's a sense that you should be like we just said there you should be at a certain level and a, be a certain type of person at a certain age at a certain grade um and that puts a lot of pressure on 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 any given child and also mm -hmm. this sense of you know i need to get an a i need to get a nine i need to do whatever that happens to be i need to do well in sats you know i'm obviously not good enough because i need a booster or i am good enough but i've got a booster so i should be above and beyond what i should be not mm -hmm. i just am who i am and i'm looking to learn and to thrive in what i want to do so i think as soon as that changes and it becomes child-centered and it's all about where are you putting your energies in because you love it you know i love going to do football practice great so okay it might not be that you like some other subjects as well but when you can tie it in and how these things are relevant that all becomes part of the mix and in my particular situation you know music was so important I was able to take the things at school I was less bothered about and put them in their in their in their pot as it were because I would you know I might be spending you know three hours a night practicing because I had something coming up which was really important to me that mm -hmm. might be that I spent slightly less time on my homework doing something else <laughs> and and therefore but that was okay because actually this thing eventually became my career and the other thing yeah. was that I didn't care about it but we have to prioritize you know we talk about teacher well-being and, and and I just always think but you talk about workload so you're at school all day and then you have to go home you've got family life and then you've got all the stuff you need to do in the evening that's really hard as an adult what's yeah. that like as a child you know you're at school all day you're growing you're 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 stepping into this new life and then you've got to do homework mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no freedom there there's no time there and um and and I, and I think understanding how all that fits in would be different i know children that really struggle with mental health especially if they're really struggling one of the first things they do is they strip everything away and they get you back into the arts you know we're going to spend some time coloring drawing focusing bringing your mind back to a moment which is just purely about you and, and you kind of think if the if the evidence is there and the knowledge is there for that to be the case why is that not the central point of what education yeah. is to begin with 
And then you layer up the things beyond that. But what we're doing is we're saying, no, you have to do this. And then when you get into trouble or if you start to struggle, we'll then give you things that support it. Well, let's just give us give everyone a life that's supportive for them generally. And then everything starts to thrive. But again, you get back into that, you know, cycles of of years and governments and policy mm-hmm. and all of that. And, and, and I think that's why it's really difficult to do. Yeah. And I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying. And I think that's the problem when some of these government policies seem to have been made by people who <laughs> maybe somehow were not even children themselves. I don't know, <laughs> because they clearly, yeah, homework. I agree with you on that as well. Homework for me, I'm not a big fan. Reading every night, 100%. If they've got something like a spelling test or, you know, times tables in the car is kind of a maximum. Um, but, yeah, sheets and sheets of homework or all of those, you know, obvious SATs booster type books for homework practice. I just, yeah, it's it's not my ethos of education, to be honest. No, and it's, you know, it's that kind of, well, how do you go about doing that? And I think it was interesting from my standpoint as a parent and also from my teaching standpoint is actually kind of allowing that space to be kind of I know this is what you're being told but we're almost like a triage triage service of kind of you know my my daughter for example just did GCSEs last summer Mm -hmm. um and and I think her first day at secondary school it was kind of welcome to secondary school our current GCSEs have just done brilliantly focusing and it's like (laughs) You know, you talk about well-being. The first thing you want to do is to make them feel comfortable, not start worrying about something five years away. Wow. Um, and that just sort of built over. And I have to say, the school was brilliant at doing what the school has to do, which is making sure they spend so many hours and do so many things to get good grades. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, we were the ones going, let's think about how this is going to be structured. Let's think about the things you're doing around school. Let's think about taking time off. Let's make sure we've got movie night in place and we're doing all these things where Mm -hmm. we're actually supporting you as a whole person. And, you know, you have to do your GCSEs. (laughs) And there's always going to be something you're learning, but just the way that you particularly put that in, put that in place. And so I, I think, yeah, it's really key in that. And from my teaching point of view, it's that kind of, I understand that you're struggling with this, but let's talk about how it fits in. I know you don't want to tell me that you can't do it, then that's fine. You've come and told me that you haven't practiced this week because you've done this, 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 and this because you've got a really busy life. That's absolutely fine because it means that our lesson today can be based on the fact you haven't done that. And next week, you've come and you said, actually, I've had a really easy week and I've done X amount of practice. And I go, fantastic. And then we can do that. And I think Mm -hmm. when you can put that into perspective, it's kind of like, look, let's think where we were a year ago and here we are today look how much better we are and that isn't because you practice the same amount every day necessarily it's because over the course of a year you've been able to ebb and flow with the amount of time that you've got how it's fitted in with your class how you've Mm -hmm. you've had birthday parties at the weekend or you've been on holiday and some weeks where you've had a lot less and and that's fine you know it has to be that you kind of then you're taking responsibility for how your life lives as much as you can with your parents and everyone else supporting you of course but Mm -hmm. but but Mm -hmm. but then it's I think it just takes the pressure off at that point and when you can still see that you know you still have the opportunity to to learn this piece you played in a concert and you've um you know you've been able to support it and become to point one of the groups at break time or whenever they are and you just think oh fantastic and then they start to see and understand but i think it's that that personalized um and sort of child-centered experience of what that is and how they can then apply it across the board definitely definitely and do you feel mark that you know having having this kind of understanding of that ebb and flow and everything and, and this way of working do you think that supports children beyond their education or or into adulthood I think it has to because I think it, it puts it puts you at the center of, of who you are and I you know it's something I still struggle with is no I'm as passionate about what I do um, as I ever was and it's very easy to spend all your waking hours putting your time and effort into it and then you realize but you know you need time off you know you need to have a balanced um, life whether that's you know activities or sport or music or something around it and I think understanding that how can I whatever my goals are or whatever I'm trying to achieve or whatever I'm being told I have to do how can I do that better now with some knowledge and understanding 
So I know mm-hmm. that being active is supportive. I know that getting sleep is supportive. I know that actually not studying isn't supportive because I'm then going to worry about the fact I haven't put the, the time in to learn the things that I need to do. So it's working what all those pieces are. But I think if you think of it as a spoke and you're in the middle, you can work out where all those things can then create the bigger wheel around you. Um, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and it's really hard to do. And it's something you develop into as you go through. And I think that's where your job as a teacher and a parent develops over time because how you have those conversations like we said in in sort of nursery or reception you know where you kind of you're creating this environment and it's all free and away you go it's going to be very different when you're studying for GCSEs or A-levels or like say at university but if you've kind of had a gradual kind of expansion of what that looks like and how people have taken responsibility for themselves and grown into their passions and their learning that they want to do then I think hopefully like you say when you get the students that you get to teach they'll have more of that understanding of what that looks like and also be confident in themselves that if there are if there is an issue or they're not sure they'll want to have that conversation with you rather than kind of you're keeping your head down and just sort of hoping mm-hmm. that no, no one notices and uh, and go from there yeah yeah no they definitely all avoid my old con- eye contact when I say who's going to come up and tell us what what you thought about it yeah, yeah. they all look the other way but um not all of them know and some some of them are absolutely amazing but I feel like for some of them maybe they've been done a disservice through our education system you know where they haven't always had to speak publicly or you know whatever it is or, or work in groups I feel some of our students find that really tricky and I feel like once you go into the place of work you're going to need to work as part of a team you're going to need these skills and and a thread that seems to have run through what you said today mark is is about communication as well isn't it yeah absolutely like and- being able to have those conversations you know between teacher and, and pupil or pupil and parent because as soon as it's not about um, failing or grades, it's just about a continual journey. Because I know I'm certainly not the person I was yesterday, let alone five years ago or when I left yeah. school. Um, <laughs> then, then you realise that that's it. You just surround yourself with the people that are going to help you and support you as you go. And, and interestingly, you mentioned there about careers and that sort of thing. The other thing that I find amazing about the current education system and what it's why we're doing it is, of course, so many people in the, in the working world want all those skills you just spoke about. Um, and yet it's not being part of that community at large. You know, we sort of said about sports clubs and people supporting, but actually businesses and actually taking an active role, but actually really an active kind of conversation with with schools in learning environments about, you know, this is important to us and this is going to be important mm-hmm. to the economy at large. It's going to be important to the way, you know, the world looks going forward. Um, and I think having those stakeholders actually stand up and put their hand up and say actually no what we're getting at the moment and what how you're educating children might not be what any of us need so how can we therefore make a difference and we all know that as soon as the government realize there's enough people behind that and it can become their idea then things may well change definitely some really good advice there mark um i've got one last question if i can squeeze it in please before we finish yep um we've talked about childhood education today what about mark centered <laughs> mark centered well-being what so just to finish on what what does this look like for you how do you recharge after a busy week of you know teaching music what's good for you um so sports a big one i love playing tennis um i love nature i love getting outside and walking um we've got a lovely garden here that kind of the thing I like about that very much is the sense that no matter what I do, it, looking after the garden, you know, like you said at the very beginning about the seasons, you know, everything's starting to die down here. Mm-hmm. You sort of allow it to do that. You look after it and you know in the spring it's going to have recharged and then there's a whole new lease of life. And I think knowing that naturally that happens as long as you allow it to be the case. So, you know, getting the rest, being active allowing things to die down when they need to and then getting the momentum going when that happens to be available to you um, and working with the environment that you have rather than against it I'm a big believer that you know there's a reason why in the summer you have much more energy when the sun's coming up at four in the morning and going down at sort of 10 at night because why would you not because it's daylight you know in the winter Mm -hmm. it's the opposite of that so it's understandable that maybe we should be working differently or less or allowing our bodies to kind of work in those ways so I think certainly that ebbing flowing with time and and resources and keeping active but also with with the kind of the 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 natural elements that we have around us and realizing that that probably has more of an impact on us than we're willing to allow wow such good advice there mark thank you yeah i think it's just remembering we're only human isn't it like like you say some days are good days some days are trickier days and um 
not being afraid to accept that and just accept that you know better things will come and be kind to yourself in those harder moments right yeah, absolutely i think that's great advice oh mark it's been such a pleasure talking to you today um i wish you all the best for the weekend thank you to everyone that's listened in mark once this is done and published we'll send the link with you so please do get sharing um with your network so they can listen back as well and i'll definitely be checking out your podcast <laughs> oh, brilliant thank you so much for allowing me to chat it's been absolutely fantastic and keep up the great work because it's sharing these conversations which is really supporting people definitely you're so right thanks for all your wisdom today and for giving us your time on a friday morning my pleasure thank you take care mark bye bye, -bye. in today's educational environment students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face -face, online and blended learning courses canvas by instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly, and access actionable data that drives student success. This show You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.